Well, good morning, House of Prayer. Don't you know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything is held together by the power of His Word. And if you need a deliverance, it's in the Word. If you need a healing, it's in the Word. And if you need a breakthrough, it's in the Word. Do you believe that with me this morning? Well, you may be seated for a moment. I am grateful and honored to be standing here today get, getting to preach to you guys. I do not take this lightly in any way. It is a strong burden to carry the message of the Lord, and I do not take it lightly. But I get to preach the first service, and my brother's going to preach the 11 o'clock, uh, but I get to set the tone. There's nothing like in the Super Bowl when the team gets off to a two-touchdown lead, and the other team ain't looking so hot. So we're going to try to get off on the right foot and get a step ahead of the enemy for the next service. Amen. First, I just honor the Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. You are first and foremost in our life. I honor my pastor and my bishop, my mom and my dad, uh, Sister B, and all the prayer warriors who have prayed. My sister, Lady K. Not only does she run multiple ministries over here, but she also runs I wouldn't say runs the house because pastor runs the house, but she takes care of her house and she does everything with excellence. And we honor her this morning. <laughs> to my brother, TNT, and lastly to my wife. Man, if you don't have a good wife, you need to get you one. Because <laughs> she is amazing. And I have truly found the favor of the Lord because I have found a good wife. So you can stand for the reading of the word. We'll be reading in two parts of scripture this morning, just trying to set the stage for what we're talking about. We'll be in Revelation 13, 11 through 17. It says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb. But he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to the earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Because just standing there isn't good enough. Then he required everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Because you see, Satan wants to mark you. But God already created a mark before Satan ever even thought about his mark. And that's where we'll be in Exodus 13, 8 through 10. This is God speaking to Israel, his people. He said, on the seventh day, you must explain to your children, I am celebrating what the Lord did for me when I left Egypt. This annual festival will be a visible sign to you, like a mark branded on your hand or forehead. Let it, be, let it remind you to always recite this teaching of the Lord with a strong hand. The Lord rescued you from Egypt. And so the title of my message today is simply called The Mark of of the least the mark of the least now pastor is currently writing a book called the mark of the least but you will want to check that out when it's time but today I'll just be borrowing that title 
And I did get copyright approval, so we, we should be all good. I think we'll be good. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you humbly, God, but also boldly, knowing that your word is powerful and it holds everything together. We pray today that, God, your will is done and that we get out of the way for whatever you want to do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now, there have been many markings throughout the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Ezekiel, Corinthians, Ephesians, and Revelation all speak of different type of markings. Because marks identify. We are all marked with our parents' DNA. It's engraved inside of us because everyone belongs to someone. Seats are even marked before church. Got your phone on it, your Bible, your purse on it, your car keys, anything to mark your spot. And some chairs are even invisibly marked, if you know what I'm talking about. And if some random person moves that mark, well, we may have to repent at the altar after. <laughs> Sitting in the same seat, it's just something that we do. But isn't that what the enemy does? He tries to move the mark of God's people so he can sit on the seat of your heart. Right. And we live in a world with many type of marks. We have birthmarks, tattoo marks, jewelry marks, scar markings, and ministry marks. If you're in ministry, you know what I'm talking about. Because if you're going to do anything for the Lord, ministry is going to leave a mark. But the book of Exodus forms a unique mark of God's people. And Revelation simply reveals a mark of Satan's people. But that's history. God creates, Satan copies. And these two marks mentioned, they're both found in the 13th chapter of their respective books. Exodus 13 and Revelation 13. And the number 13 is an interesting number. You see, because the word dragon which is a symbol for Satan, is found 13 times in Revelation because Satan and his mark are behind all rebellion against God before the church. See, the wall of Jericho is stamped with the number 13 because the city was marched around for six days. But on the seventh day, they came back and marched seven more times, bringing a total number of 13 marches. Church, I'm telling you that the mark of God's people is going to bring victory in the end and the wall of the enemy is going to come crashing down. Can I get a witness in the house? It's interesting how in the book of Revelation it talks about the mark of the beast and worshiping his image. Now there are many things that we accidentally worship, right? But this image will not be one of them because the truth is, is that praise on the outside is just an expression of worship on the inside. And I'll put it like this. Satan's mark is to control you for free. But God's mark says, well, you are free. Now, this word mark, you see, it's very interesting. It's similar to what what's called human branding or stigmatizing which is simply the process by which a mark, usually a symbol, is burned into the skin of a living person with the intention that the permanent, that the scar makes it permanent. Do you have any permanent scars in the house this morning? Any scars that tell a story? You see, I'm marked with two scars on my, on my left knee from surgery I had about seven years ago. And I kind of still walk with a limp every now and then, just kind of unconsciously. People ask me, you hurt? You know, like, you all right? Like, you got an injury? I say, no, I, I've been marked. Something has happened on the inside of me. I've been marked by the Lord. And my brother has a scar down the middle of his stomach where he was marked. But scars that come from human branding, you see, they're usually made to identify a person. It is practiced as a rite of passage, R-I-T-E, rite of passage, 
or to signify acceptance into an organization. Now, I want to highlight that word rite of passage for a moment. It's a ceremony that occurs when an individual leaves one group to enter another group. It involves a significant change of status in society. It's interesting how Paul said, for I bear on my body the branding marks of Jesus. These testify of his ownership of me. You see, Paul is saying, I used to persecute the church, but you see these scars on my body? Well, now I am the church. I used to share blood, but church, now I'm blood bought. I used to be lost, but now I'm found. Do you testify of the working power of Jesus this morning? Because he is my Lord and King. I'm talking about the mark of the least. And that's why we can't just dress how we want. Because the scars of Jesus, they don't look good in the clothes of this world. And the problem in today's world is that it is becoming extremely difficult to tell who belongs to who. Sometimes the church looks like the world. The world looks like the church. Everybody looks like everybody. That's called twinning. Me and my brother do it all the time. But the thing about my brother and I is that we don't normally like to dress alike, if you can believe that or not. There are times when we show up to places with the same shirt on. And I'm like, dude, seriously, man? Like, come on. Same shirt again? But sometimes it's the same with the church and the world. All seem to be wearing the same clothes. And no one wanting to change simply because we're all too comfortable in what we are currently wearing. Everybody is just looking like everybody. So God started a distinction back in the book of Exodus. See, Moses was sent to free the people from Egypt. But Pharaoh kept refusing to let the people go. So the death angel passed and killed all the firstborn males in the land, except for those who had the blood on the doorpost. And that is the mark. The mark is the blood and in the New Testament it's the blood of Jesus and that's where we pick up in our opening scripture you see God told them to always remember the day he brought them out of Egypt it should be like a mark branded on the hand or on the forehead because sometimes that's the only way we remember things right if it's marked on our head or even our arm so they come out of Egypt and they get to a red sea now, Moses, we have a problem. Probably thinking they might have made a wrong turn somewhere back in Egypt. I mean, have you ever made a wrong turn driving? And you didn't realize it till you were way down the road, didn't know where you was at? Well, that's where they are. Except now there's another problem. You see, Pharaoh starts to come after God's people. And now they are trapped between the enemy and the water. It's interesting in the beginning that God separated the light from the darkness and then he divided the waters. And now God had just separated the light, his people, from the darkness, Pharaoh's people, and he is about to divide the waters once again. You see, if you could only understand God's divine order and structure, then maybe Pharaoh's army won't look too big after all. And so God parts the sea and he drowns Pharaoh's army as they follow them into the water. And we call that baptism. You go in the water being chased, but you come out of the water being led by God. You see, that's what happens when Pharaoh tries to come out of his jurisdiction. Because it was God who hovered over the water in the beginning, not Satan. And you see, the promised land, it was supposed to be a short journey that actually took 40 years. Now, I'm not that smart, but if the map says days and it takes years, then Moses, we must have had another problem. But that's the wilderness journey filled with many ups and downs, twists and turns, a dry place with, with unclear direction uncomfortable delays, and simply exhausting battles. 
but if you only knew the purpose of a wilderness. You see, in the Greek, it means uncultivated land. It's a land waiting to be cultivated. It's a land waiting for something to happen. And the Bible says Jesus was baptized and then led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by Satan. Interesting that the children of Israel had just walked through the water and God led them to the place of Marah, which the Bible says God tested them. Church, don't be surprised when your obedience leads you straight into a test. Take a sip. Now somebody say, it's about to get real. Because here comes Mount Sinai. Moses, he goes up the mountain to talk with God. And the people, they get impatient. And they say, we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses over here. He's taking too long. Let's make our own God who can lead us. So now, Moses is just a fellow. And pastor, he's just that dude. And leadership, oh, that's just those people. And now we find ourselves turning against God when all we ever meant to do was leave the church. Because next they took their golden earrings, they melted it in the fire, and they carved out a calf to worship. That's what happens when you stop speaking about what God has done in your life. You can literally begin to speak another image into existence. So Moses, who is up the mountain, he gets wind of what the people are doing down in the camp. Because God usually tells the leader what's going on in the church. Surprise, surprise. Help me, Lord, when my pastor is on the mountain getting instructions for the house. So then God says, Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people, they have corrupted themselves. And I can imagine Moses being like, my people, this was your plan. That ain't my people. This is your people. So Moses took the calf. He burned it in the fire. And he scattered it in the water so that the people had to drink it. Now, this is the beginning of Satan's mark. Because the people had to drink the idol that they just worshipped. Signifying that they were marked by a calf or marked by a beast. Teaching us to be very careful what we worship because we may have to ingest what we just declare. And you see, the ones who were marked by the image could not advance to the promised land. God called them a stiff-necked people. And since they couldn't acknowledge what God had done in the past, they would never experience what he could do in the future. So then Moses said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come over here. And now God is separating people again. But this time, he's doing it with those in the camp or those in the church. Because you see, Egypt required you to be in the house, but the wilderness requires the house to be in you. Meaning, just because the blood is on the house doesn't mean the blood is on your heart. Wanting the advice of the pastor without the submission to the pastor, or maybe the protection of the house without the commitment to the house. Can I get a witness in the house? Because church, I'm telling you that the blood must go from the doorpost of the house to the doorpost of our heart. Because God will make you intentionally choose a side. That day is coming. And if you aren't intentionally renewed, you're going to naturally go back. And I'll put, it, I'll put it like this. The blood frees you. The water washes you. But the wilderness determines your destiny. So God puts us in a desert to reveal who his people really are. Because in the end times, people will have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power that could literally save their life. So God takes care of all this, and it's found in Ezekiel 20. He says, I will make you pass under the rod so that I can purge the rebels from among you. Because you see, 
the shepherd used to stick out his stick so that the sheep could pass under it and he could count them. They were to mark every tenth one as holy unto the Lord, teaching us that we are a holy nation. We are to be separated from the world as holy unto the Lord. Now we have the marked and we have the unmarked. But church, we must always remember the day that God pulled us out of our sin. Too many people are dying in the silence of their testimony instead of living in the power of declaring their testimony. Because you see, at least 11 times in the book of Exodus, the Lord himself refers back to what he did for his people in Egypt. Now he's bragging on himself. And so if he talks about it, then church... We must talk about it. Yeah. And so God says it's like a mark branded on the hand or forehead so that you always recite what I've done for you. A mark that turns into a word. We call that a testimony. The power that defeats the enemy over and over and over again. Because if he saved you, then you need to speak like it. If he's delivered you, then maybe you need to dance like your church because you have a weapon of mass destruction and you need to use it on the enemy. Amen. Hallelujah. We have the power in Jesus name. We have the weapon. I'm talking about the mark of the least. Because you see, after 40 years of wandering through the desert, they get to a city called Jericho. The line of the promised land. The city had strong, high, intimidating walls that surrounded the entire land. So Joshua, he sends two spies to check out the land. And they cross paths with a prostitute called Rahab who hides the men and helps them so that they don't get caught. But she said something very interesting to the men. She said, the news has reached the city. We heard how God freed y'all back in Egypt and what he did to Pharaoh's army. And now we are trapped inside of these walls because all the men in the land are terrified of your God. Meaning the testimony had already reached the enemy. And I know it's been 40 years of nothing but trouble. But church, while you've been wandering in the wilderness, God had already been speaking to your enemy. And church, I feel this for somebody today that it's not too late for you. It is not too late for God to do something for you. Because while you were wasting time in the desert, God had already been setting up a time for the promised land. But you see, what's interesting is that God took the fight out of the people of Jericho, but he left the walls of Jericho standing. Meaning, if you don't shout about it, you can't have it. If you don't speak it, you won't see it. Don't let the enemy be the only one to recognize his defeat. Because church, I don't know about you, but I refuse to lose battles that God has already won for me. Just obey, just shout, and just take the land and walk in your victory. God has given it to you. I'm talking about the mark of the least. You see, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Yeah. And that we do not love our lives unto death. So we have the mark. We have the evidence of the mark. And then we have that we never lose that mark. Amen. Because it's extremely hard to hold that mark. Amen. Amen. Life seems to hit us so hard at times that we don't remember who we really belong to. And let's face it, we all do this, especially men. We know how to start a project, just not finish a project. We find a church, we struggle staying in church. We start a ministry, just struggle staying in that ministry. Because life has a way of wearing us out to the place where we feel we just can't continue. But the Bible has some encouragement for us. These are just a few key words that the Bible says. 
It says, hold firmly, hold on, continue to believe, be on guard, stand firm, keep a strong grip, and stay true to what is right. I think God knows our weaknesses. He knows where we go wrong and where we have these, these times of weakness and doubt. But the good news this morning is that he tells us in his word how to preserve our mark. So I'm almost finished. The musicians can come up. But it's found in Leviticus 2.13. God said, you shall season every grain offering with salt so that the salt or the preservation of the covenant of your God will not be missing. So that's it. You got to throw some salt on it. Probably thinking, this dude crazy up here, man. Talk about throwing some salt on it. But if you know anything about salt, salt helps hold fluids in the body. Hospitals usually give an IV of saline or salt water for dehydration. Salt is a preservative. Salt helps maintain. Because see, your blood has water mixed in with it. And the water helps the blood travel throughout your body. Water also cleanses the blood of any toxin buildup, relatable to repentance and baptism. But then trials come, one problem after another, and they seem to suck the life or the water right out of us. And if you don't apply the third part of your salvation daily, you get what's called spiritually dehydrated. And when we stand up to serve the house or to come to church, we get dizzy. We get lightheaded and we say things like, I just need to sit down for a season. I can't really think straight at the moment. I don't have the energy to keep pushing towards the promised land. But that's where the salt comes in. The salt, it's the word. You get marked by the blood, you get washed in the water, but you are sustained by the word because he sustains all things by the power of his word. And your testimony holds everything together. If you can speak it, then you can seal it. We also call that the Holy Ghost. Testifying through me that I'm a blood bought, spirit filled, child of the most high and nobody can take that away from me and out of the thousands of people that God freed from Egypt only two from the first generation made it to the promised land ten spies they said we can't have the land but Joshua and Caleb they say, well, God already gave us the land. Yes. Only two carried the testimony from Egypt all the way to Canaan. Yes. And if you have God's voice, then you surely have God's mark. We're talking this morning about the mark of the least. You can stand to your feet. I've shared before you know, a little bit of our story, me and my brother and what he went through. But this is my real testimony. About 10 years ago, I had a dream, 10 years, give or take. And I remember the dream literally clear as day. And in this dream, I was in this gym, the gymnasium, this gym, and they had this guy sitting on the bleachers and he was looking through a photo album and I remember I want to see what he's looking at so I remember I walked up to him and I sat down right next to him and as soon as I sat down he grabbed me now he he held me and I don't know if you ever seen the movie uh the Batman movie the Dark Knight where the Joker kidnaps the main character or the girl main character and he has her by the neck at a party he has a he has a, a knife by her neck and he's just holding her tightly and every everybody in the party is just kind of looking around seeing what's going to happen what is he going to do and in my dream that's exactly what was going on 
this guy had me in his in his grip and people were around just looking and I remember trying to get out I was I was literally fighting I was trying to get out and I was trying to slip out and I would feel like I would almost get out but every time I almost got out I slipped right back in and I looked down and I remember seeing this guy's hand literally wrapped around my whole body it wasn't just my stomach his fingers went all around my back all the way back to the front and his hands they were like green lizard skin and I remember thinking in my mind this is the devil this is Satan himself that had a hold on me and so I looked in the crowd and behind those people was this guy pacing back and forth and he wasn't saying a word he was just looking and I remember thinking that's Jesus that's Jesus so all of a sudden this guy Satan he pulls me upside down and he starts hitting me and every time he hit me he was accusing me of something and I remember that he was talking to Jesus not nobody else he was accusing me every time he hit me he would accuse me and if you know anything about the strong right hand of the Lord I'm telling you right now I saw this hand literally I was upside down and all of a sudden this hand came from the crowd touched me and I broke free now I wish I could tell you how it happened I wish I could really explain better what happened but all I know church is that once I was bound but now I'm free once I was addicted but now I'm addicted to Jesus I don't know if that's you this morning but there is delivering power in the house tonight today so this is the altar call if you need a breakthrough you need to be set free of anything whether it's fear anxiety whether it's addiction bondage strongholds a mental stronghold it doesn't matter what it is right here is delivering power if he's done it for me then he can do it for you so if that's you this morning you can come up right now and get your breakthrough because God himself is here and if you're in the crowd this morning and you don't necessarily need a breakthrough you just need to renew your testimony because you have one but you haven't been declaring one I need you to come up here and pray with these people because your breakthrough is going to help them get their breakthrough we're going to seek the Lord for a few minutes because I believe that he is here to set the captive free